Turn to page 21. We're going to pray Luther's morning prayer. And then over the next couple of days, next couple of Sundays, we're going to be back here in the middle of the commandments. Today we're going to read the sixth commandment, and I'm going to set this one up today with more of our culture and how we view the commandments is my purpose in this today. And we're going to see, I'm going to try to connect a ton of dots. I'm going to try and do 15 Bible studies in one. So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to try to accomplish a lot because I want to see more big picture today and not get in the weeds and not get in a bunch of questions and things. And, and I want to tackle where we're at as a culture. And especially this whole thing that I've been talking to so many people over the last couple of months and all I hear in spades is, I'm spiritual but not religious. And I don't need to, I don't need to come to church. Because I'm, I'm a spiritual person. And it's very interesting. A pastor gets interesting Christmas gifts. But I got three books for Christmas this year. And I've read most of them here in the last couple of weeks. And it's really tackled this whole question. Especially dealing with the Sixth Commandment. And kind of the hashtag slogan that's out there in space. Love is love. Love means love. And we're going we're gonna to really tackle that here over the next couple of Sundays. So let's open up here on page 21 with Luther's morning prayer. We'll begin with the invocation reminding us where God, that's our identity, we'll talk about it here in a moment, where God baptized children. And we'll pray Luther's morning prayer and then recite the sixth commandment. And then we're going we're gonna to jump into some things here and go through those speeds. So let's begin here with the invocation on page 21 in Luther's morning prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. And let's turn to page 4. And we're going to recite together here the Sixth Commandment. We're going to look at the Sixth Commandment and this whole love is love deal. It's, it's all over, especially for our young people today. It's, it's, it's the educational system, it's social media, it's entertainment, it's everything that they're bombarded with, that we're all bombarded with. But let's, let's look here at the Sixth Commandment and recite that together on page 4. You shall not commit adultery. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we lead a sexually pure and decent life in what we say and do. And husband and wife love and honor each other. All right, what I want to do today is take out your sheet here and look at the Ten Commandments of Self-Worship. I decided to print these up. I've taken these from a couple of books that I've been, that I've been reading here since Christmas. Uh, it's, it's from two books here. One is Don't Follow Your Heart. Boldly Breaking the Ten Commandments of Self-Worship. I took a lot of them from this book. And then I added a few from this one. Live Your Truth and Other Lies. Exposing Popular Deceptions that Make Us Anxious, Exhausted, and Self-Obsessed. And so, uh, I've read these two books over the last couple of weeks in my free time. I've had some here for the Christmas break. And these two books... Uh, that really made me do a lot of thinking over the last couple of weeks. And especially, they've been tackling this thing that I've been having a lot of conversations with people about. I'm spiritual, but not religious. And I've really had a hard time trying to understand what is this spirituality? And these two books have really helped me understand it because really, it's, it's the oldest. They think they're cool and they're avant-garde and they're hip. And they're, and they're on it and everything else. But really, it's, it's the oldest religion in the world because it goes back to the garden. You can be God. With, with Satan's temptation to add in. You can be God. You can decide what's good and what's bad. You can do you and run your world. And, it, and, it's, and, it's, and it's very, very, very interesting. 
I want to read from another book here, Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. This is written by a lady who used to be a professor of English and Women's Studies at Syracuse and was a ardent lesbian, feminist, and she was a real radical uh, and just did a lot of crazy stuff, wrote a lot of crazy stuff, and she waltzed into a church one day, became a Christian, and now is married to a pastor. And it's, and, it's, and it's an amazing thing. I've heard her speak. But she just came out with this book. It's Rosaria Butterfield. And she writes this about this whole spirituality thing. She says, Today, spirituality welcomes people exactly as they are. Or at least it makes that promise. This is a religion that elevates being a good person over following Christ. To the unbiblically spiritual person, everything is one. Creation and Creator. God is in you. You're in God. Everything is just spiritual. Hence the name of spiritual, but not religious. I may pray to a God, but I don't know who it is. It may not be anything. It may be nature. I'm, I'm one with everything. Distinctions and hierarchies are called abusive. And true spirituality is supposed to be found inside of this sort of spirituality, the biblical spirituality, believes that everything in the universe shares the divine power and balance that makes everything more. Rules, divisions, and distinctions are violent, or so says the unbiblically spiritual person. In this whole idea that I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, you have a God. And the irony is, who is it? Yeah. It's the God of self. They think they're cool. They think they're hip. They think they're, you know, all this, that, and the other thing. But the interesting thing is, it's a very satanic, a very satanic religion. And it's just, it's just very, very, very interesting. In one of the books I was reading, does anybody know a guy by the name of Anton LaVey? Anton LaVey founded the Church of Satan in the United States several years ago. He had two guiding principles in the Church of Satan. The interesting thing is you're going to see it in the Ten Commandments of Self-Worship. You're going to see it today in our culture. It's our culture to a team, which shows you our culture is so satanic, it's unbelievable. Here's his two principles. Number one, your desires, the desires that are found where? In your heart, equal reality. There's no truth outside of you. And it's whatever your urges are, whatever your desires are. The irony is you can actually go what? Sin. But your desires equal reality. And if this is reality, the logical thing just follows next. If this is what reality means, it means I have to follow my what? I've got to follow my desires. I've got to follow my urges. So that's principle number two. You must follow your desires then, because that's the real you, and that's reality. That's the whole thing we're going to see. Hashtag authentic. I've got to be my real me, and if I'm not, well then, I'm not real. It's not reality. There's no way I can be happy and find fulfillment, purpose, and meaning in life. The Church of Satan, Anton LaVey, is two founding principles. Desires equal reality, and so because of that, I must always follow my desires. The interesting thing today, if you look at our culture, what is that? That's our culture. Exactly. That's our educational system, it's politics, it's entertainment, it's music, it's the media, it's everything. And here are the Ten Commandments of self-worship. Put down from what? All the hashtags that you can find on Twitter, formerly known as Twitter, now known as S. All right, that's the hashtag. It's the handle that it's a trending thing. So here are the ten. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. 
we're just going to run through because I want this operating in the background for you over the next couple of weeks as we look at commandments 5 and 6. But here's the Ten Commandments of self-worship. Number one, live your best life. Thou shalt always act in accord with your chief end. Glorify and enjoy yourself forever. Now, instead of glorifying and enjoying yourself forever, this is where we get out Bible studies too. The cows come home. We should be glorifying and enjoying who? God. First commandment. Fear, love, and trust in him of all things. The second commandment, hashtag, God wants you to be happy. The real sad thing that we talked about for a very long time here today is this has actually become what most Christian preachers today in churches are teaching and preaching. God wants you to be happy. What God? <laughs> That's the question. For Anton Bay, for the spiritual person, it's the God of self. So thou shalt pursue happiness at all times. Whatever that means. If my wife ain't making now, this is not my personal case, but as long as you spouse, that's better. If your spouse isn't making you happy, then what do you do? You change your spouse. If your religion ain't making you happy, you what? Change your religion. The whole idea then is what? My circumstances, what I kind of talked about around about when I'm Christmas Eve in the sermon. So often we think our circumstances is what drives our happiness and joy. But that's not the biblical thing that we talked about on Christmas Eve. The good news of great joy is what drives that. Which doesn't change depending upon your circumstances. But for the person today, you go to a shrink, you go to a counselor, you go to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, whatever it may be, a life coach. The whole point is if you're not happy, God wants you to be happy. So what do you do? Change the circumstances, change the things that you think aren't Make you happy. Hashtag number three. Follow your heart. Thou shalt obey your emotions at all costs. That's today. Feelings control everything. The problem is, is I was reading this morning, I'm starting to work my way through the Bible in this app that I'm using. So we're, we're in Genesis 6 here this morning that I'm reading before I come to church, right there at the start of the, of, of the flood narrative with the generations of Noah. And God's mad at, at everything because he says the inclination of their heart was only evil all the time. What does Jesus say? Out of your heart comes bleh. And then he lists all the sins. So from a biblical thing, is, is, it, is it wise to follow your heart? No, we should probably follow God's heart because that's what God talked about with David. He's a man after my own heart. When David followed his heart, how did it go for him? Trouble, adultery, the commandments we're dealing with. Adultery, murder, all right, lying, number eight, stealing, seven, coveting, nine, ten, everything else. Got him in huge trouble. But the commandments of spirituality with the God itself is, I follow my heart. This is culture. This is what you get in a college ethics class today. Number four, hashtag be true to yourself. Thou shalt be courageous enough to defy other people's expectations. <laughs> I was reading one of the books here today. I haven't saw the Grammys in umpteen years. I don't think I'm missing anything. <laughs> but the Grammys from, was last year. The author was talking about the perversity that was on there. I guess is I don't even want to read to you what was done with strippers and cages and everything else that was on the Grammys. And Madonna got up at the end with these other two uh, artists. One's a trans person and the other, I don't know, identifies as something else. And she said, we finally got to the point, be true to yourself, that we can defy other people's expectations and we're, and we're uh, what did she, how did she put it? I can't remember. We're uh, breaking new ground and we're cutting edge. And as I was thinking about this, I'm like, no, you're actually as old as the Garden of Eden. If you want to do something new and cutting edge, don't give in to the urges of your heart. Then you'd be doing something new and you do something cutting edge. Um, number five, the hashtag, maybe some of these you've heard before, you do you. You live your truth, let others live theirs. Instead of the word of God, of course. YOLO. Maybe you've heard of that one. Number six. Thou shalt pursue the rush of a boundary-free existence. 
Number seven, hashtag the answers are within. Thou shalt trust yourself, never letting anyone, here's the word from our woke Bible study of the summer and spring, never let anyone oppressing you with the antiquated notion of you being a sinner. Number eight, hashtag authentic. That's very important in today's world. You must always be authentic. That's why if I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, I've got to be a woman at all costs because that's my authentic me. Thou shalt invent and advertise thy own authority. This we'll talk about in the upcoming weeks with the Sixth Commandment and the trans issue. Everybody else has to bow down and acknowledge and accept the craziness. But the interesting thing is, is I don't make anybody address me as a baptized child. My identity is a baptized child of the Most High God. And if you don't identify me as that, I want you to be thrown into prison. <laughs> I, I, I don't run around telling people have to identify me as a baptized child of the Most High God. But now, for everybody else, you, you have to identify and acknowledge and accept that and celebrate it. Otherwise, you're a bigot, racist, homophobe, blah, 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 transphobe, whatever it is it may be. But there, there's the whole idea that you've got to invent your own identity. That then, whatever your desire is at that particular point in time, becomes reality. That reality, then, if you're going to live in a real world, according to them, must be followed at all costs. Number nine, hashtag live the dream. Thou shalt force the universe to bend to your desires. We've been talking about it, and here's where we're going to be at. Number ten, love is love, or love means love, or whatever it is. They're all the same hashtag, same thing, slogans that are out there. Thou shalt celebrate all lifestyles and all love lives as equally valid. Here's where we're going to jump in today to an introduction to the Sixth Commandment, and what I want to keep, kind of work our way through here today is have these ten. We could talk about each one of these and have a Bible study on it. But what I want to do is kind of show, this is, this is the culture. For our young people today, this is the air that they breathe. I mean, it is just in the air, and it's just accepted as, as, as being truth, and this is how we run everything. But it's a different religion. Sad thing is, so many churches that preach this nonsense because they can't scramble fast enough to become hip, relevant, tolerant, as we're going to talk about here in a moment. And so I'm going to try to kind of tackle all the things that are operating behind the Sixth Commandment and the Fifth Commandment. We'll do a little bit of that here next week since I wasn't here for that and was with the uh, kids who are getting ready for the children's Christmas program, running through some things here before Christmas. But uh, I want to kind of hit a few things from the Fifth Commandment and connect it to the Sixth Commandment and, and kind of talk about how the world sees things and how Christianity is totally different. So what I want to do is start here very quickly. Open up your Bibles to Mark 8. We're going to be all over the Bible. Not doing a lot of commentary on it, but I want to basically, in a crude way, hit you over the head with the Bible today. And show you over and over and over and over and over again how different <coughs> Christianity is, how different God is, how different love is from God's standpoint than what the world is. And we're going to, we're going to do a lot of stuff with Jesus. Because Jesus today is not the real Jesus that's being shouted out in the public square, proclaimed, taught, preached from many pulpits or platforms of churches today, and, and talked about in our schools and chat forums, online stuff and everything else. Let's start out here with Matthew 8, verse 34. I mean, I'm sorry, Mark. I'm sorry. I, I went down the page here too quick. Thank you, Mark. Mark 8. Stay where you're at. Mark 8, verse 34. Getting ahead of myself here. We'll get to Matthew. Mark 8, verse 34. Mark 8, verse 34. Jesus said, calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, if you want to follow Jesus, be his disciple, be a Christian. If anyone would come after me, let him follow the Ten Commandments of self-worship. What is, what, is, what does Jesus say? Let him deny. deny himself. We don't exalt ourselves. We actually deny ourselves. 
Do we follow the desires of our heart and self at all costs? No. Jesus says you deny yourself. We could we could look at John, we could look at so many things. We could look at John the Baptist and his preaching. What does he say? I self must decrease and Christ must increase. We can look at St. Paul. I no longer live, but what? Christ. Christ lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I no longer exist. We can could, we could pull out quotes from Martin Luther. Martin Luther once said, it's a great quote. He said, if someone knocked on the door of my heart, talking about the heart here, if someone knocked on the door of my heart and asked who lives there, I would say Martin Luther used to live there, but he moved out and Jesus has moved in. There's, there's where we're at. Everything in true Christianity is in opposition to being spiritual. Because spiritual really is the God of self, and really it's the original man-made default religion that we're all born with, which is Satanism. Which is, Satan is not there to uh, beat you over the head and beat the living daylights out of you. He's there actually to try to make you happy. We're getting ahead of ourselves here in the church here. But I was thinking about this this week. Just, just run very quickly to the first Sunday of Lent where we got the temptation of Jesus. God the Father is making his son suffer. Suffer! Satan comes along and says, well, if you're the son of God, gee whiz, if I was your father, I would be treating you this way, man. I mean, look at what your dad's doing to you. He, he, he's really a loving dad? You haven't ate, man, for 40 days. You're looking pretty ragged. You've got circles under your eyes. You're pretty beat up. I'll tell you what. I'll feed you. I'll give you something to eat. You want pleasure? You want safety? You want health? You want the kingdoms of this world? You want wine, women, and wealth? I'll give it to you all. You follow me. I'll show you what it's like to what? Follow the desires of your heart and have a rocking good time. So this, this whole idea of being spiritual and, and the Ten Commandments of self-worship, it's actually just the original satanic religion from the garden. You can be God. You can run the show. You can do what you want to do. You can follow the desires of your heart. You can decide what truth is. You're your own boss. You're, you do you. Be true to yourself. Follow your heart. You only live once. The answers are within. Be your true authentic self. Which... With the God of self, you are being your true, authentic self. This is the natural default religion. We're all religious. We're all the natural default religion that I'm born with. It's the God of self, and I'm being who I am, which is what? Being a sinner. That's not being avant-garde. That's just being who we are. It's not being radical. It's not being hip. It's not being cutting edge. It's not breaking new ground. It's as old as the first week in the garden with the sin of Adam and Eve. But Jesus says, deny yourself. So now, what I want to look at here is stay in Mark and turn to Mark 10. And we'll, we'll get there here in a moment. But what I want to do here is kind of tackle this whole, before we dig deeply next week into the fifth and sixth commandments and break out Luther's meaning, I want to get at kind of where we're at in culture here today. Where we're at in a lot of Christian churches today, it kind of shows they're all messed up. Especially with this love means love, love is love, and everything else. And I, I want us to think about how does this kind of work out in your life? How do you see this? How is this permeating kind of into your thoughts? And one of the things that I read in this book, and I kind of forgotten about her, and I read about her four, five, six years ago, and this was a real big thing. Many of you, well, let me just ask, anybody know who Glennon Doyle is? Good. I was hoping nobody knew. Six, seven, eight years ago, very popular Christian author. Huge. Had a massive following. Bestsellers, everything else. She was a popular Christian blogger, too. She had a Christian mommy blog. She had millions of followers. Millions of followers. And um, one day, she was doing a book tour. She had written this new book. She was doing a book tour. And uh, a woman by the name of Amy Wombach came in. Anybody have heard of her? She was kind of the original radical on the U.S. Uh, women's soccer team before Megan Rapinoe. Before Megan Rapinoe and her lesbianism and anti
anti-Americanism and kind of everything else was, was hitting, it was Amy Wambach. She was a lesbian, married to, I can't remember what her first name was, something Huffman, another uh, women's soccer player. So they were lesbians, married, everything else. Amy Wambach came to Glennon Doyle's book signing. And you can read all of this. In fact, I read some of the accounts, some of this in People Magazine. Went online so you can research. I mean, it's, it's, this story has been huge in People Magazine and recently because of some things that have happened in her life. But Amy Wambach came to Glennon Doyle's book signing, and Glennon Doyle says she touched my arm and said that she really appreciates the books and it really helped. And she touched my arm, and Glennon Doyle said it just sent tingles up my arm. And I was struggling with my marriage, and it just it just electrified my heart, and I had to follow the urges of my heart. So I went home and divorced my husband, and I was married with three kids, and I uh, moved in with Amy Wambach, who quotes divorced her wife, all right, whatever Huffman, whatever her name was, the soccer player, and so now they got married. They got married. And so now she's wrote, uh, written uh, 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 now another bestseller, Untamed. She writes about all this on her blog and everything else. This has become now a huge thing in Christianity right now. Is now what do we do with Glennon Doyle? Because she says, God now loves me just the way I am. And she'll pull out all these things that we looked at right here with the Ten Commandments of Salt Worship. I am doing what? Following my heart, and I'm very happy, but then if you read some of the current issues of People Magazine, is this what happiness looks like? Because now she says she's dealing, and now she's putting this on her blog, she's dealing with alcoholism, and she's struggling with anorexia and bulimia. And, she, and she's really now struggling with all of these, these things. And she wants people to come and help her. But one of the things that was, was pulled out here in uh, one of the books I read about this was some of the online interactions that Glennon Doyle has had over the last uh, year. And one was from a really good friend. She included it on one of her online blogs. A really good friend from the church that she goes to who sent her an email and said, Glennon, I'm having a really hard time. I always looked up to you. Um, I always admired you. You were always a fellow sister in Christ. I guess they were very close friends. But now I'm at a crossroads. I don't know what to, to do. Because why? Scripture tells me that what you've done is, and are doing is sin. It's wrong. You know, you divorce your husband. You quote Mary now Amy Wambach. You celebrate this. She's very now active in the pride community, pride days. And, I mean, she's, she was at the ESPYs and and they were both wearing Love Means Love and Pride shirts, and you can, you can look at it all online. I just perused some of it this week to kind of refresh my memory with kind of where they're at and where they're at now. And so this, this lady said, I, I'm really struggling with what to do. Included in this book that I read now was Lennon Doyle's response to her friend. This is what she wrote. And as we always do, we put it online for everyone to see. We never have private conversations. Let everybody know what's happening in our lives. And she wrote back to her friend, Glennon Doyle, the quotes Christian author, said this. First of all, thank you for knowing that you now have a choice to make. Thank you for not landing on the I love you, but. We know that love has no buts. If you want to change me, you don't love me. If you feel warm toward me, but also believe that I'm going to burn in hell for my sin, you don't love me. If you wish me well, but you vote against my family being protected by the law, you don't love me. Thank you for understanding that to love me as yourself, notice there, that's the summary of the second table of the law, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Notice how they come and hear this stuff. You, you, you love yourself and you're looking out for your interests. Notice the Ten Commandments of self-worship here. If you're going to look out for your interests, you also have to look out for, you're following your truth, I've got to follow my truth. But we'll use scripture. 
Thank you for understanding that to love me as yourself means to want for me and for now, my new family, every good thing that you want for yourself and your, for your family. Anything less than that is less than love. Anything less than that is less than love. Now, I love... <laughs> pardon the pun. <laughs> I love the paragraph that this lady, I'm beginning to really like her, I've been, uh, uh, there's another story here about, I'm going to buy some other books, her name is Elisa Childers, she's got a podcast now and some things, she used to be, I don't know, a singer with Zoe Girl, would be, be Greek Zoe, she's a Christian singer, and now she's a reformed Christian, and she's got a lot of good stuff, I don't agree with everything, but she's got a lot of great stuff, this book is one of them, but here, here's her paragraph in response to all this. She says, this definition of love is now so pers persuasive because it accomplishes a couple of things. Number one, it appeals to a desire most people have, which is to be viewed as what? Nice, tolerant, and considerate. Second, it's a passive-aggressive way to shame those who don't agree with your particular theological and political opinion. It's actually quite totalitarian in its demands. Consider the line, if you want to change me, you do not love me. But here's great. Follow this to its logical conclusion. For Doyle, Glennon Doyle, to logically be consistent, she would have to admit one of two things. Either she doesn't love her friend because she's obviously trying to change her. Or her definition of love only goes one way. For this view to remain logically consistent, it would have to apply to any sexual relationship anyone wants to engage in. Or any definition of family that one would want to believe in. That could get dark very quick. But that kind of love is not real love. It's not the type of love the Bible describes and commands. In fact, according to Doyle's definition, Jesus himself wasn't even loving. Now, here's where we're in Mark 10. Turn to Mark 10. If you haven't already done so. Turn to Mark 10. 17 to 22. Now we're going to go through warp speed here, a bunch of stuff in the Bible. And see what the Lord has to say with his understanding of what love is. Mark 10, 17 through 22. This is the story of the rich young ruler. As he, it was Jesus, setting out on his journey, a man, a rich young ruler, came up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We can talk about that until the cows come home. And Jesus said, No, why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments. Now notice he doesn't start with one, two, and three. He's going to start with the second table of the law. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, five, six, don't steal, seven. Don't bear false witness. Don't tell lies. Eight. Don't defraud. Go back to four. Honor your father and your mother. The guy says to him, Teacher, that's child's play. All these I've kept since I was a kid. I haven't broken any of them. <laughs> now, in a roundabout way, this is bad application in my part, but I think there's a contemporary application here today. If you look at the commandments, and the commandments, we kind of reinterpret them today as Advice on how to be nice, how to be loving, how to be tolerant, how to care about people, and we don't really look at it with regards to what we're actually doing, saying, and thinking, because we'll get to that next week when we go to the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to pull in one thing here from Matthew in a moment. I was ahead of myself here a little bit ago when we went to Matthew in my mind, but we'll, we'll go to Matthew, but we're, we're going to go there over the next couple of weeks. But Jesus says, we can make the commandments out to be very easy for us to keep. I never pulled out a gun and blew somebody away. I never, I never stuck my honey knife in anybody's back. I never broke the fifth commandment. I'm a pretty decent chap. God says, wait a minute. You ever hated anybody? You ever said anything bad to anybody? Well, you've committed murder in your heart. Did you ever eat at Christmas or Thanksgiving? Yeah, you broke fifth commandment. You hurt your body. All of a sudden, the, these commandments are a little bit deeper than what we thought. They're a little bit deeper than what we thought. The guy goes, man, I, I haven't been in any other woman's bed. Dude, these are, these are nothing. 
I haven't blown anybody away. I didn't stick a sword in anybody's gut. I, I'm in, aren't I? Jesus is going to go, I'm going to go to your heart because in your desires because your God is your yourself. Now, there's a lot of other stuff going on here, but that's just what we're going to keep it today for the sake of time. He says to him, teacher, all these I've kept since I was a kid. Now, here's the beautiful part where we got to get the application here. And Jesus, looking at him, what's the word? Loved him. What does love look like? Does love now say, this is Jesus? Well, you do you, man. Yeah, you're exactly right. You do you. You follow the desires of your heart. You're a good chap. You're a good guy. I'm tolerant of you. I can't say anything bad about you. I want you to have your best life now. I want you to be happy. I don't want to be a Debbie Downer. I'm just going to tell you, you just keep doing you, man, and keep rocking on. Yeah. Is, that, is that what he says? Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said, what? You lack something, Father. One thing. He's not going to talk about all the other commandments. You've got a wrong person on the throne. You've got a wrong person on the throne. And I'm going to show you how you've got the wrong person on the throne. So all you have to do to the poor, and then you have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He went away. Now you would think today, in the world today, that's the last thing the Christian church would want to do, is send somebody away. My job is to authenticate you and your life's path according to the great churches of today. Jesus says, dude, you're on the wrong road. You got the wrong God. And Mark says, that was love. That was love. Now, we can talk so much about everything here, but it's we, we, we just got to kind of keep going because I want to keep building on this. I want to read um, one more thing here from Elisa Childers, what, what she says about this. She says here, as we look at this text from Mark, let's, let's revisit our cultural definition then of love. Let's look at what Glennon Doyle says. Love has no buts. If you want to change me, you don't love me. But look at Mark 10. Jesus was obviously revealing something in the rich young ruler's heart that needed to change. According to this cultural definition, you can't change somebody, Jesus wasn't being loving. This might be a good opportunity for all of us to check our own hearts. Are we going to believe a popular writer about love, or are we going to believe Jesus who is love incarnate? Love itself. John says God is love. He's love in the flesh. He says that you need to change. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. We might be able to get all this done. We're going to have to go quickly though. Go to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to look at one of the letters of the seven churches. Thyatira. Revelation 2. Verse 7. Last book in the Bible, Revelation 2, verse 18. If you don't get there, that's okay. For the sake of time, I'm going to start here. And to the angel of the church, that's the pastor, the messenger, of the church in Thyatira, modern-day country of Turkey today, Asia Minor, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. These are the words of the Son of God. Who's the Son of God? Jesus. So in quotation marks, this is what Jesus says. I know your works, your love, your faith, your service, your patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I want to change you. I've got this thing against you. Now he uses the wonderful word of today. That you tolerate. Ooh, I thought we were supposed to be tolerant. That's a virtue today. Jesus says, I have this against you that you tolerate. You tolerate who? That woman Jezebel. I don't have a lot of time to do the Old Testament. You know, she was kind of a wicked woman. For what reason? Sexual issues. Number six. Jesus is going to blow that out for you. You're tolerating that woman Jezebel, some sort of woman in the church. He's going to call her Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. 
and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice what? Sexual immorality and eat food sacrificed to idols. Most of the time, you went to a shrine prostitute, you'd have a love and feast with these pagan religions, and then you'd have sex with the shrine prostitutes. This woman is trying to incorporate these sorts of things. Jesus says, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto her sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw her into great tribulation, unless they repent. Unless they repent. Notice, in the Ten Commandments of self-worship, you never go against your desires and you never repent. We'll talk about that when we end the commandments and so forth, when we look at sin, forgiveness, repentance. Notice there's no repentance today that's ever preached because there's nothing I ever do that's wrong because what's ever in my heart, I must do. Jesus says you must repent. You must repent. And then he says, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give each of you according to your works what flows out of your heart. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of... The interesting thing is the Ten Commandments of self-worship and the God of self and following your heart. Jesus says they come from where? He says they're the deep things of Satan. So any Pastor Almeyer telling you, that's why I wanted to give to all this. This is Jesus himself <coughs> saying this. Calls him the deep things of Satan. To you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers, who keeps my works until the end. To him I will give authority over the nations. Alright, let's continue on. Let's go now to Matthew 5. <coughs> we might be able to pull this up. Matthew 5. Let's look at Matthew 5, 17 through 19. Matthew 5, 17 through 19. The Sermon on the Mount. We're going to go back to the Sermon on the Mount later on when Jesus actually tackles murder, anger, lust, divorce, loving your enemies, all that good stuff. But what I want to do is look at this. Matthew 5. This is a hidden gem. Matthew 5, 17 through 19. Most churches today preach a hippie Jesus. The hippie Jesus is, I come to just make you happy, you do you, you only live once, do whatever you want to do, follow the desires of your heart, peace out, love, man. What does is, what is Jesus say? This is not the Old Testament, folks. So we're going to talk about the next couple of weeks. Jesus doesn't come to actually turn down the thermostat of the Old Testament. He actually comes to crank that sucker up. To where it gets to the point where it's unbearably hot. That, and there's a reason for it. And we'll talk about that. But we're going to introduce it here today with Matthew 5, 17. Jesus says, words of Jesus again. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish it. So many churches today, especially the evangelical Lutheran church, will say, God is now doing a new thing. To quote the country song, those commandments and everything that we're studying right now, that was then, this is, this is now. And God's doing a new thing. Jesus is doing a new thing. He's always reforming, always changing. He's always thinking a new thing. Don't, don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Then he says, truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, the dot on an I. All right? Not, not a dot will pass away from the law, the commandments, until all is accomplished. Therefore, here's the great verse. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Those are Jesus' words. Relaxes. Folks, that's the Christian church in America today. Especially with the sixth command. I've always wanted to know why that's one we don't have to keep. Ah, it's okay, that, that one. Uh, that, that, that's fine. Really, really shouldn't murder. Except for other. There's exclusions to that one too. But 
Sixth commandment, no, you know, lying, cheating, stealing, I guess we can say that's wrong, but for some reason the sixth commandment is I've got to follow the desires of my heart because that's reality, and we don't have to keep that one. Jesus says, don't relax them. Make them easier. Because as we'll read later on here in the Sermon on the Mount, don't make them easier. He says, you've heard that it was said long ago, don't commit adultery, but I say anyone who lusts at a woman in his heart has committed adultery with her in his heart. You've broken the command. So don't relax them. Go to John chapter 14. That's why I said I would, in a crude way, take a two by four and hit you with the Bible. John 14, because then it's just, it's, it's Jesus' words. And I, and I think we need more Jesus in the church today. John 14, verse 15. Jesus tells his disciples this. If you love me, John 14, if you love me, you will do what? You'll keep my commandments. What does love look like? Keeping these commandments that we're studying. Not following the desires of your heart. It's following the desires of God's heart found in the commandments. If you love me, you will keep them. That's love. That's what love is. Because John tells us in his epistles, God is love. So turn to 1 John. Turn to 1 John, verse 5. First John chapter 5. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5. Let's go there. 1 John chapter 5. And let's look at verses 1 through 5. 1 John 5, 1 through 5. You may have to have somebody with the uh, large print Bible yell out pages once in a while. One of the other things I got for Christmas was a new large print Bible that had old print. And uh, it's a little easier for me and my older eyes to see. So, especially now that I have multifocal contacts, I have to <laughs> kind of do this. Sometimes you'll notice in church I get numbers wrong. I did today with the intro, if anybody was paying attention. I was going like, this song is at 45, 46, I don't know. Let's get the multifocal contacts in the right spot. But um, let's look here at... Uh, 1 John 5, 1 through 5. John writes, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God. What does love look like if we love our neighbor as ourselves? In opposition to Glenn and Doyle. When we love God by doing what? Obeying His commandments. Gosh, I, I think there's a theme here. By obeying his commandments. For this is the love of God. Now he said, I know there's going to be some real hmm, interesting people living in the 21st century in the United States. And inhabiting their Christian churches and actually preaching from pulpits. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And in opposition to the commandments of self-worship, his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who's been born of God will overcome this. You want to be the true Christian church, you're going to have to overcome this self-worship. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Now to close, I'm going to go, and we're going to make it. Thanks be to God. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 13. For those of you who know your scriptures, know that's the what? The great love chapter. I thought, let's end there. All right? Might as well have a husband and wife up here and get married and we'll read 1 Corinthians 13. All right? But let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 6. We've looked at Jesus. We've looked at John. We've looked at John the Baptist. Now we get Paul. Um, we're kind of hitting everybody here. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 6. As you're turning there, Paul's going to tell us that the greatest thing in the world is love. Love. The world's right on that. They, they got the buzzwords right. And because of that, they're always kind of wanting to tweak it, and they know deep down there's something powerful in that word. And, and for that, I applaud them and everything else. 
But since this is the most important thing, because faith right now is very important, but when we get to heaven, we're not going to need faith. Because we're going to see face to face. We're not going to need hope because we've got it. But Paul says one thing will continue, and that is love. Why? Because God is love, and we'll be able to have perfect love. So how we define love is crazy important to God. Crazy important to God. And here's, here's why I wanted to end here. It's a great definition. 1 Corinthians 13, 1-6. Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but don't have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can even move mountains. Jesus talks about that. But if I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned, there he's thinking of being martyred for the faith, but I still don't have love, I gain nothing. This love, man, is about to be pretty important. Well, what the heck is it? Paul says, I'll tell you. Love is patient, love is kind. Now, the interesting thing is for the world out there, the slamming, the self, you know, the, the, the Ten Commandments of self worship out there, are they very loving and kind? No, you will do this. If not, that's the end of you. Well, that doesn't seem very loving to me. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not have pride in love. It doesn't. Right? It, it doesn't envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. You know, we talked about seven deadly sins in our woke Bible study. The first deadly sin is the sin of pride. Take away the sexual nature of Jew. Pride in love. Just to, to throw it out there, pride, that's the original sin. There's something huge wrong with Pride Month right out of the gate. I don't care if it's Pride in the North Side when I have a month of Pride for the Chicago Cubs. There's, there's, there's something wrong there. There's, there's something because it's all about and, and me. It's the God itself again. And the interesting thing is we're going to talk about everything else. All of these sins always come back to the sin of envy and pride and jealousy. It's, it's coveting. Even, even the trans sin. Forget the sexual nature of it. It's, it's a sin of coveting. I'm a man, but I want to be a woman. I want what you've got. Or vice versa. Or I want to be a dragon. Or I want to be a goat. Or whatever it is, I want to be a shooting star. And that's what I want to identify as. Whatever it may be now. But love is not arrogant. It's not rude. It does not, it does not what? Insist on its own way. Wait a minute here. I, I, there was one of them here. Thou shalt force the universe, live the dream, to, to bend to your desires. Wait a minute. Number nine. Thou shalt invent and advertise thine own I, I, identity. Live your truth and let others live theirs. All these run into each other. They all bleed into each other. But it's, it's, it doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. Now here's the big thing. It does not rejoice in what? Wrongdoing. There's pride month. I rejoice in what? Breaking the commandments. Not only do you have to let me do what I want to do, you've got to come alongside of me and jump up and down and rejoice with me and celebrate it. No, it doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing because it rejoices with the, with the truth. It rejoices with the truth. I want to end. We're out of time. We didn't get to everything I wanted to do, but we got a lot of the Bible. I wanted to pull out some other things, but I knew we were going to be racing against the clock. But I wanted to get all this scripture in before we really dig deeply into the commandments, five and six here over the next couple of weeks, and see kind of how the world looks at things and how scripture and Jesus, more importantly, looks at things differently. But I want to end with one more quote here from this book from Elisa Childers about love. And, and she ends this whole thing here with love means love and love is love with this. She says, God's love was made manifest in the person of Jesus. In other words, God showed his love to us by sending his son as a sacrifice for sins. One of the things I want to talk about today that we didn't get to is that in a biblical understanding, love is not an emotion or a feeling. 
And that's another song. What, what is it? Uh, was, it, was it Tina Turner? Love is a secondhand emotion, or whatever that song. I don't know. For some reason, it just clicked in. Right? Yeah. What, what's 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 love got to do with it? Thank you. There we go. That's, that's, that's Dick Clark who helps us out. Thank you. But the interesting thing is, I wanted to talk more about this because we turned it all into desires and everything else. And I knew for the sake of time, I probably wouldn't get to it. But from from a biblical understanding. Yes, there's an emotional component to it. So don't say pastor doesn't believe that. But from, from a biblical standpoint, love is a person. Love is a person. And who is that person? Jesus. God loved the world in this way. Who talks in the Greek? Not God so loved that he looked at us and gosh, all my earth and all I love him so much. No, no, no. It's, it's who talks. God loved the world in this way. How does he love the world? He gave his, his one and only son. Not a warm fuzzy or a back rub. He gave his one and only son. This is how God loves the world. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we're still sinners, boom, Christ died for us. St. Paul, Romans. God loved, showed his love by sending his son. As she says here, for a sacrifice for our sins, 1 John 4. Here's her closing. Once we understand that God is actually love and body, and then he showed his love to us through Christ, we can love others. According to 1 John 4, 19, we love only because God first loved us. True biblical love isn't based on the object of love, but the giver of love. That's why we need to get rid of the Disney, Kenny Rogers, Ron Com type of love that's we now go on for the same time. So we've got to get that all out of our heads. <clears throat> True biblical love is neither a trite affirmation of someone's life choices, nor holding somebody hostage to your own politics or theology. Christian, you can pick anyone off the street and love them. Because true biblical love doesn't keep score. That's 1 Corinthians 13. It keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't expect rewards in return. As Paul says here, she's quoting, it tells the truth. It believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Because as she closes with, love is a person. And love is willing to suffer. Notice in the Ten Commandments of self-worship, there's never any suffering. But I open with this, and I'll close with it. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, deny yourself. Pick up the cross and follow me. What does picking up the cross mean? Crosses hurt. They're suffering. It's deny your desires, not pursue them at all costs. Jesus has something different to say. Love eternally will always give of self to others. Notice in the definition for the world, we'll close with this, of love. It's always about what I'm going to get out of it because it's all connected back to self. The biblical definition of love is not a cheap get, but it's what I'm going to get. Maybe giving my entire self for somebody else. Greater love is no one than this. You lay down your life for your friends. And Jesus said it and did it. And he didn't die for his friends, as Paul told us, told us. He died for his enemies. While we were still enemies, sinners, Christ died for us. Does the Bible, does Jesus have a different definition of love? Yeah, yeah, he does. And it's a better definition of love. And it's a better definition of what it means to be actually a human being. Because that's what we're losing today, is humanity. The commandments of self-worship will destroy yourself and destroy humanity. The Ten Commandments of God actually show you what it means to be a human. And that's where we'll begin next Sunday, as we'll look at the creation account of man and God's original design for mankind, male and female. And that's where we'll go next week. So let's close here with a, with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, this is the day you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And we give you thanks. It's another day to live under you and your kingdom, to serve you 
and everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. That we can begin to understand what true love is, your love for us, and that love will pour forth in our lives as we love one another. Bless us, O oh Lord, as we continue to grow in our understanding of you, your kingdom, and your love for us and our love for others. For we ask all this then in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.